between us today. <laughs> All right. Hello. We have got a great show for you today. We got a legend uh, that's going to be on our show, but I will let Scott introduce him. But my name's uh, Jody Bishop. Uh, my brother Scott is with me. We are the truth seekers and we are the disciples of YHWH in Christ. So please subscribe to our channel, share our videos, and also pray for us. I mean, that's the most important. Pray for us. And if you got any ideals for great shows, let us know. If you think you'd be know of a great speaker, let us know that too and how to get in touch with them. But uh, to hear, to introduce um, our speaker is Brother Scott. But, but by the way, if you want to email us, Disciples of YHWH at gmail.com on Facebook, Disciples of YHWH in Christ on Facebook. And also, you can join us. Uh, we'll put it down in the link on Knowing God program. That'd be every other Sunday. We'll put it in the link, and you can give us a call personally. So uh, here to introduce our speaker is Brother Scott. All right. Thanks, Jody. Uh, our speaker is Robert Spencer, who's been on our show before, so we don't need to have a long introduction. We're going to be talking about his book, the Did Muhammad Exist book, the revised and updated, which just came out uh, recently. And Robert is a great researcher. He, he really helps to distill all this information into something that's uh, easy to digest. And this book is no exception. Uh, he's written a lot of uh, great things. He has a, a, a website, jihadwatch.org, which is exposing all the problems with violence in Islam. And they tried to kill him. So we know he's being effective when they're trying to kill you. So welcome, Robert. Thank you for being on our show. It's always good to talk to you, gentlemen. Good to see you both. Thank you for having me on. All right. Can you give us a, a capsule summary of the thesis of this book? Did Muhammad exist? Yes. Uh, when you look at the earliest records of the community of Arabs that came out of Arabia in the 630s and started to conquer the whole world practically. They conquered the Middle East, North Africa, Persia, India. By 100 years after this, 732, they had an empire stretching from central France through Spain, all across North Africa, the Middle East, Iran, and into India. Massive empire. And most people generally think that all this was inspired by Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and the Quran, the Islamic holy book, because the Quran says to fight against the unbelievers and to subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law. Muhammad, according to the Islamic traditions, did that. And he's the excellent example, the person that all Muslims should imitate. And so most people have assumed throughout history that these massive conquests were inspired by Muhammad's teachings and the Quran. But when you look at the actual records from the seventh century, from the time when all this was happening, there's an extraordinary thing about it, about those records, that is. And it is that there's no mention from the 630s into the 690s of Muhammad or the Quran or Islam. There's plenty of material. What we have is we have writings by people who were conquered. Sophronius, the patriarch of Jerusalem, the Christian leader of Jerusalem, left behind extensive writings about the conquest, talking about the people who took over Jerusalem, talking about what they believed, talking about what they said to him, and he never calls them Muslims, he never mentions Muhammad, he never mentions the Quran, and he gives no hint that they had a new prophet or a new religion or a new holy book. And it's the same all through in every record. Meanwhile, we also have monuments, inscriptions, buildings that were made by the conquerors, and they don't mention Muhammad or Islam or the Quran either. And there are a lot of strange anomalies. The coins that they minted have crosses on them. And yet the cross is considered offensive in Islam. In Muslim countries, churches aren't allowed to have crosses on the outside. And 
the cross is considered the Quran says, and I can mention my upcoming book, the critical Quran, mm. which is this, this is the Quran you need. If you want to study what Muslims actually believe and what the Quran actually says, a lot of Qurans will try to cover it up, but this one makes it all clear. And so you go to chapter four, verse 157. And it says, because of their saying, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. They did not kill him nor crucify him, but it seemed so to them. They thought they had crucified him, but they didn't. And because of that, Muslims to this day believe that Christians actually are believing in a deception, that Jesus was not crucified. And that it's offensive to say that Jesus was crucified because Allah would have been able to rescue his prophet from that kind of humiliation. And so it's an insult to Allah to say this. Now, I'm saying all this because a lot of the early Muslim coins or the early coins of the Arab empire, I should say, they have crosses on them. Why would any group that thinks the cross is an insult to Allah, an insult to their God, put the insulting image on their coins. It doesn't make any sense. The only thing that makes sense out of all this, and there's plenty more, of course, but the only thing that makes sense out of it is to say that it's to realize that Islam was invented later and Muhammad was invented later. He's more like Robin Hood than he's like uh, George W. Bush. In other words, he's more myth and legend than historical reality. And he was invented and Islam was invented in order to provide an impetus for unity for this new empire. So Muhammad was not the cause of the empire. He was an effect of the empire. And so that's the capsule summary. So as, as with Robin Hood, there may have been some historical kernel of a person behind that myth. Would you say there, there may have been a, a historical person, not the one described in the Hadith and Sirah, but, but someone who inspired the myth? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, we have actually mention of Muhammad, and a lot of Muslims try to use this against everything that I'm saying. There are mentions of Muhammad from the 630s. The problem for the Muslims in this case, though, is that those mentions don't actually correspond to Muhammad in the Hadith and the Sira literature. And so you've got to somehow explain the discrepancy, and they never even attempt to address it. What seems to have been the case, there may have been somebody whose name or title was Muhammad, who uh, became part of the Muhammad legend. But there is no record of the person who is described in the Islamic texts about Muhammad. There's no record of that person, ex person existing at or just after the time that he's supposed to have lived. Not until 200 years later do we start hearing about him in any detail. Right. What, what I like to say to the Muslims is that we're looking for a specific Muhammad in history, the one whose father's named Abdullah, whose mother's name is Amina, whose, whose wife is named Khadija, who is a caravan trader who received these revelations. That particular Muhammad, we don't find when you look at these coins and inscriptions and these writings. So what we're saying is not there was no one called Muhammad. We're not saying that. We're saying that the, the Muhammad that you've been told about, the one who's written about in Hadith and Sirah, that one didn't exist, as you said, for 200 years. So that's, I think that's an important to distinction that you were making. You know, the particular Muhammad that, you, that everyone thinks of is not revealed in, that, in the histories. So, so what does the historical evidence actually reveal? Nothing. Really, uh, what you have is there. It does seem to be an indication that the conquerors, the Arabs, were monotheists, that they believed that their religion was derived from Abraham, and that explains why you have Hanifs, Hanifa in the Quran. The Hanifs, for example, in chapter 3, verse 67. Let me get the critical Quran, which is available now. Oh. Pre order at Amazon. And, uh, <laughs> I, I found it here on Amazon so I can show people. There's the pre order page on are, Amazon. Are, 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 are it's, they it's in, I didn't set up the they, price, but it's massive. It's, it's very large, comprehensive, 560 pages. 
Anyway, yeah, Jody. Yeah, any chance of putting that on Audible for me uh, for people that don't have time to read? <laughs> and your book, um, Did Muhammad Exist? I noticed it was not on Audible. I noticed a lot of your other books was on Audible. Are there any chance that I can talk you into putting the, that Quran and, and, and Did uh, Muhammad Exist on Audible? I didn't. I actually didn't know. Didn't Muhammad exist? Was not, and I'll ask the publisher about that. And I think that can be arranged. But as far as this one goes, I don't think it's going to be on Audible because, see, this is this book is the whole Quran. You see, it's mm -hmm. divided on the pages at the top. That's the Quran, and then starting here, that's all the notes. So it would be very hard to put on Audible because what would you do? Read the Quran all through and then read the notes and then you wouldn't know which note went to the which piece of the Quran. Or if you read each note before you went on to the Quran, then it would become even more disjointed and disconnected than it is already. So you see, it's, it, it's not really a book you can put on Audible, I'm afraid. Right, a uh, reference book. You wouldn't read the encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I will read chapter 3, verse 67. Abraham was not a Jew, nor was he a Christian, but he was a Muslim Hanif, and he was not one of the idolaters. The Hanifa in Islamic tradition are pre-Islamic monotheists. Uh, but of course, it also says he's a Muslim. And this is because the original religion of all the prophets is supposed to be Islam. And then their followers twisted and hijacked it to create Judaism and Christianity. That's the standard Muslim view. But the Hanifa would, would in a sense, correspond to the Abrahamic monotheists the, uh, who didn't seem to have a very uh, clearly determined creed that the early Arabs appeared to have been. But that's still a long way off from having, there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet, and this is his holy book. And so you have to pray five times a day and you have to circumambulate the cube in Mecca and so on. That's a very far from all that because we don't start hearing about all that till the eight, 700s and mostly in the 800s. Now, I'm reminded when you talk about the pre, uh, pre uh, the Arabs who lived there before what we came to know as Islam appeared and how it, uh, Muhammad is invented. One of the justifications that the Muslims give for Muhammad is he came to this region of ignorance, the Jahiliya, that there was a time of ignorance. They didn't know God. They didn't know the prophets of, you know, essentially the Bible. And Muhammad is the illuminator who brought this information to them that they didn't have. But I wrote a paper in seminary on the myth of Jahiliya, which is mentioned in your work uh, briefly and mentioned in other people's works. Not many people realize that there was quite a thriving civilization in parts of Arabia, the, you know, around the desert, but not in the desert, uh, down south, up north. Can you speak to that myth? Well, Najran Jahiliya. Center. And uh, Najran in southern Arabia, just north of Yemen, was a, uh, a, a Christian territory. There was a Christian area of Yemen as well. And there are legends of Muhammad from the ninth century here again, where the Christians of Najran travel to Medina to talk to him. And they say, uh, we know this, the leader of the Christians tells the, the rest of them while they're on their way. We know this guy's the prophet. He fulfills all our prophecies. Now, of course, anybody who knows anything about Christianity knows that they weren't looking for a prophet at this time. You know, the, the Lord Jesus said that it is finished and it, it was finished. There's no, that's it. So the whole thing was wrongly framed, but in any case, this is what the story says that they were, they know this is the prophet, but they can't say it because the Byzantines give them money on a regular basis. And if they say that Muhammad is a prophet, the Byzantines will cut them off. Now, this is a very important story because it reinforces, actually it establishes the idea that the non-Muslims who reject Muhammad only reject Muhammad because they are in bad faith. They want money, they want power, they want fame, they want something, 
and so they reject Muhammad. The assumption is every non-Muslim, all three of us here, especially Jody, <laughs> we all know that Muhammad is the prophet, but we refuse to admit it for whatever reason. We think we can get money saying this or who knows what, but this, is the, this has become a foundational belief in Islam. Basically that all the unbelievers are in bad faith. There is no concept of somebody who doesn't believe in Islam and being a, a, an honest, good person who wants to do what's right and even wants to serve God, but just doesn't believe Islam is true. All the unbelievers are evil and perverse and are liars because they know Islam is true. And this comes from this story of the Christians of Nazaran. Yeah, and, and that's um, all those mentions of Jews and Christians affected Islam is kind of revealing because it demonstrates that there were Jews and Christians around. This wasn't a time of complete and total jahiliyyah that needed Muhammad to bring knowledge. The Jews had knowledge. The Christians had knowledge. We know the scriptures were there. His cousin was, or um, his, his wife's cousin was translating them. So the, the whole thing just kind of collapses. But I was astounded to learn that there were churches in Southern Arabia, in, in the south of the peninsula. There were Jews living there for hundreds of years before Muhammad came. So the whole idea of Muhammad as illuminator in, in the time of ignorance is just false and obviously false from the data. Okay, you were also talking about the the writings that we have of, of, of Christians and other groups who were who met the Arab conquerors, what other things do we say? What did Sophronius have to say about the Muslims or the Arabs? Yeah. Because there's a very important legend about Sophronius that you will find people repeating today as if it were historical fact. And it is that the Caliph Umar conquered Jerusalem in the late 630s and he met, Sophronius met him at the gates of the city and invited him in and invited him to walk around, give him a little tour of the city. And so they're walking around the city and they get to the church of the Holy Sepulchre. And Sophronius, this is the church where traditionally it has been believed that this, this is where the tomb of Christ was. And so the resurrection happened right there. And so the patriarch of Jerusalem, Sophronius, he invited Umar to go inside the church and pray. And Umar said, no, 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 I can't do that. Because if I do, my followers will claim this for a church. And I mean, claim this for a mosque. And I want you to have it as a church. So see how wonderful, tolerant and magnanimous Umar was. Right. Only the catch to this story is that we have lots of writings of Sophronius. He never mentions Umar even once. Hmm. And there is no record of this story earlier than, here again, the ninth century. So the real story is quite a bit more devastating. Um, I don't know, I don't have it bookmarked in this. This is Did Muhammad Exist? The uh, Inquiry into Islam's Obscure Origins available now from any self-respecting bookstore. And let me see if I can find this without detaining us unduly. Read a little bit about what Sophronius really said about the conquerors. For example, I'm zeroing in on it here. Thank you for your patience, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. We have here, Sophronius said, the Saracens, he never called them Muslims. It's almost as if he never heard the word. The Saracens who, on account of our sins, have now risen up against us unexpectedly and ravage all with cruel and feral design, with impious and godless audacity. That doesn't sound like the benign, tolerant, and magnanimous Umar from the story. Impious and godless audacity. And so on. He, uh, he says, for example, in a sermon, uh why are so many whoops excuse me why are some never put the book down on the keyboard that's lesson one <laughs> all right uh why are so many wars being fought among us why do barbarian raids abound 
Why are the troops of the Saracens attacking us? Why has there been so much destruction and plunder? Why, is there out, why, why are there incessant outpourings of human blood? Why are the birds of the sky devouring human bodies? So it's, uh, this is all he's talking about, and that's the Arab conquest. So it's uh, hardly benign. But notice that he's talking about the Saracens, which is a word for a group of people that were Arabs, but not all the Arabs, and he never calls these people Muslims. He never gives a hint, although he notes that they're against Christianity, he never gives a hint that they have their own religion or their own prophet. He never says anything about their own holy book. We don't hear anything about the Quran as such for another 60 years. Actually, that's not even true. We hear quotes from the Quran 60 years later. We only hear about the Quran as such in the early 700s. So it's uh, extraordinary to think that the Muslims conquered Jerusalem and they have extensive dealings with Sophronius who writes extensively about them and yet he never calls them by their name and never mentions their religion that's supposed to be the impetus for their conquests. And that year, decades and decades after that go by and nobody ever mentions their holy book which is supposed to have been finished by 632 and collected together in 653 with copies distributed to all the provinces. Did, did Sophronius mention Muhammad? Nope. Or a prophet? Nope, not a bit. All right, what about the Doctrina Jacobi? We hear a lot about that mention of a prophet. Yes, well, they do mention a prophet, but uh, as I said before, there are divergences between what it says and what we know about Muhammad from Islamic tradition. So if you go to the Doctrina Jacobi, I should say the Doctrina Jacobi is a Christian record from between 634 and 640. And so it's very early when you're talking about Muhammad who's supposed to have died in 632. Mm -hmm. And this is what it says. When the Candidatus, that's a member of the Byzantine Imperial Guard, was killed by the Saracens, there's Saracens again, not Muslims, I was at Caesarea. And I set off by boat to Sikamina. People were saying, the Candidatus has been killed, and we Jews were overjoyed. And they were saying that the prophet had appeared, coming with the Saracens. Now here's the first problem. Muhammad did not come with the Saracens to conquer Syria in the 630s. He was supposed to be already dead. So whoever they're talking about is not Muhammad, unless they got it wrong. Either way, the value of the story is lessened. The prophet had appeared coming with the Saracens and that he was proclaiming the advent of the anointed one, the Christ who was to come. Now, that's another thing. Islam does teach that Jesus is going to come back at the end of the world. It's the Muslim Jesus who's not divine, not the savior, not the son of God, not risen from the dead, not, not uh, anything that Christianity says about him. He is the Muslim prophet who's going to break the cross, kill the pig and abolish the jizya. Break the cross because, as I mentioned before, it's an insult to Allah. Kill the pig because the Christians are violating the food laws they ought to be following by thinking the food laws are no longer in force because the Messiah has come and it's the Messianic age. And abolish the jizya. The jizya is the tax specified in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 29, for the non-Muslims to pay to the Muslims as a tribute so that they can be allowed to live essentially, in the Islamic State. But that will be abolished because at that point, the Christians will all have to convert to Islam or be killed. But anyway, that is all in Islam, but it's not the central teaching of Islam. The central idea of Islam doesn't really have anything to do with Jesus coming back at the end of the world. And so to say that he was proclaiming this prophet, proclaiming the advent of the anointed one, the Christ who is to come, that's, that doesn't really fit Muhammad either. So you've got two problems. The prophet's alive, and Muhammad was dead by this time, mm -hmm. and the prophet is proclaiming the Christ who is to come, which is not central Islam, Islamic teaching. And so it goes on, I having arrived at Sikamina, stopped by a certain old man, well-versed in scriptures, always good to have those. And I said to him, what can you tell me about the prophet 
who has appeared with the Saracens. He replied, groaning deeply, he is false, for the prophets do not come armed with a sword. Now that's one thing, see, this is interesting because that's a lot, a lot of the reason why people think, oh, this must be Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Muhammad's not named, but a prophet with a sword, who's that but Mo? And so this is one of the main reasons why people think this has got to be Muhammad. And yet the same people often turn around and say, Islam is a religion of peace. And those who think otherwise are racist, bigoted Islamophobes. But uh, they'll go with the doctrine of Kobe and say this is an early attestation of Muhammad because he came with a sword. Anyway, he goes on, this old man saying, truly there are works of anarchy being committed today. And I fear that the first Christ to come whom the Christians worship was the one sent by God. And we instead are preparing to receive the Antichrist. Now, is he talking about this prophet? Maybe. And certainly you got a case if you're talking about the prophet uh, of Islam being Antichrist. After all, he's the one, there's a very telling hadith where Muhammad says, uh, Allah uh, is not angry. There's nobody Allah is more angry with and will be more angry with on the day of judgment than the one who says, I am the king of kings. And so I think that's, that's just straight antichrist right there, because, of course, Jesus said he's the king of kings. So anyway, the one sent by God, and we are instead preparing to receive the antichrist. Indeed, Isaiah said that the Jews would remain a perverted and hardened heart and retain a perverted and hardened heart until all the earth should be devastated. But you go, Master Abraham, and find out about the prophet who has appeared. So I, Abraham, inquired and heard from those who had met him that there was no truth to be found in the so-called prophet, only the shedding of men's blood. He says also that he has the keys of paradise, which is incredible. The keys of paradise is not something that Muhammad ever says he's got. Mm -hmm. And so this is the final falsehood that, or not, not the falsehood, it's a final lack of congruity that indicates that the doctrine of Jacobi is not talking about the prophet of Islam. It is noteworthy that he's talking about a prophet who arose among the Saracens, the Arabs, in the 630s. And so, like we said before, there may have been such a person, but there is no trace at this point of the, all this wealth of information that we have about Muhammad in the Hadith and the Sira literature. And so you got to wonder, if the Hadith and the Sira literature are authentic, that means that they did exist in the 630s and the 640s and 650s and 660s and 670s and 680s, and yet nobody mentions them. Not only does nobody mention them, but nobody even gives a hint that they exist. Nobody quotes them. Nobody refers to them. Nobody says, we have lots of stories, by the way, about our prophet, and in 100 years, 150 years, we're going to tell you everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The beauty of oral tradition. Eventually, we'll write it down, and it will come to exist. Yeah. Yeah, I like what you just. Excuse me, just a second, but the, just picking up on that very briefly. Oral tradition usually there's an under that the, if if it doesn't isn't written down eventually. Usually, there's some indication that it exists. For example, in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul quotes Jesus saying, "It is more blessed to give than to receive." That's not in the four Gospels. It was mm -hmm. oral tradition. And it happened that he just remembered it and, and, and he said it and it was written down there. Otherwise, it would have been lost. Somebody would have mentioned all this time that there was all these stories about Muhammad, especially if they're revering Muhammad and Muhammad is as central as he is to Islam today. They would have been talking about him all the time and quoting him. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to comment on the doctrine of Jacobi. I hadn't noticed that what you said that Muhammad was not with them when they went to Syria. That The Hadith and the, the Syria literature never say that Muhammad left the peninsula, I, I don't think. So if they're saying that he came with the armies that were attacking in Syria, that would be contradictory. It contradicts the, the standard Islamic narrative. So that's interesting. And the other thing is when you mentioned the Antichrist, in, the, in, in John's uh, epistles, he says, Whoever denies the Father and the Son is the Antichrist. So he is uh, certainly at least an Antichrist uh, among the many that John talks about. Okay, so we're, 
when, you, when we look at Sophronius and Doctrina Jacobi, these are the sources from the conquered peoples. What sources do we have from the Arabs themselves in that's contemporaneous with the conquest? Uh, let's see. What do we have from the Arabs themselves that's contemporaneous with the conquest? <laughs> uh, let's see. I went through everything I could find in that regard, and it was very hard to find anything that was contemporaneous with the conquest that gave any picture of Muhammad. Uh, I suppose the, the, we could go to the coins there, and I have some pictures of the coins here in the book. You can see them there, and uh, you can see that on, let me see here, yes, on this one, there's a, clearly a cross on the, over the M on the second image, as I noted before, and that mm -hmm. this is an indication that these are this is not an Islamic empire. And I've seen many explanations for this. I've had uh, people say, well, you see, early on, the conquerors had a very light touch. They, seriously, I've had this said to me with straight. They they wanted to uh, acclimate the conquered people to Islam, and so they they gave it to them very gradually, and they were very tolerant and let them have their symbols, and even promoted their symbols. Obviously, putting the cross on the coins and so on. Anybody who knows the slightest thing about Islamic doctrine and Islamic history knows that that's absolutely beyond preposterous. If anything. That if it can be said that there is anything that Muslims have never had, it's a light touch. And that is that throughout 1400 years of conquest, as I show in my book, The History of Jihad, which I would hold up also, but I don't happen to have it right here. Uh, the History of Jihad shows that wherever Muslims have conquered, they have subjugated the, the non-Muslim people, made them pay the tax as per the Quran, destroyed their houses of worship or forbidden, uh, forbade them to have any outward display of their religion and so on and so on. There was no truck with the symbols of the conquered people. That would have been idolatry. That would have been shirk. That would have been associating partners with Allah. It's, it's just inconceivable. And if Islam existed at the time of these conquests, then it was just as inconceivable then. And yet, you have it. And so, the only way, in other words, that Muslims can explain this early material is to pretend that the conquerors behaved in a way other than the way that we know that Muslim conquerors have always behaved throughout history. Right. Oh, you were talking about jihad. Our last video with Robert Spencer was on the, the nature of, of violence in Islam is, is Islam a religion of peace? You can find it on our YouTube channel that uh, goes through those. Uh, we discuss that there. So that's a good video. You should uh, check it out, folks. So I'm, you know, I'm reminded when, when, when I asked you about the Arab sources uh, that happened, that, that come from the time of the conquest, there's, there's almost nothing. I'm reminded of Tom Holland's documentary on BBC Four, where he's, he's standing out in the desert with the, the cameras. And he's saying, I found nothing. There's just nothing there. It's, it's amazing that there's nothing from the Arabs about the con time of the conquest. I just don't know what that's out about. So we have to go with the other sources, the conquered peoples. And as you demonstrated already from, from just those two, there, there are problems. And there's a lot more of these examples in the book, which is wonderful. And even when you go look at the coins, now I want to emphasize this. You have coins with the Muslim Supposedly, Muslim leaders, conquerors, having crosses, having fire altars, like Zoroastrian fire altars on their coins. That's just, as you know, as you're saying, inconsistent with what we know about Islam. Yes. And, you know, following up on the desert, standing in the desert and saying, I found nothing. You're talking about a, essentially, a pre, for the most part, a preliterate culture. There were some Arabic writings before the Quran, but not very many. And this is not 
ancient Greece, you know, it's not a hugely intellectual culture. This is no criticism of them. It's just a statement of fact. And so here again, you have to ask, what would we see? What should we expect to see if they really did have the records of Muhammad and the Quran at this time? And I think that's a reasonable question. Now, of course, it's just, it's just speculation. And there's any number of explanations that no doubt can come into play. But if you had this extraordinary figure leaving this book and proclaiming all these things and doing all these things that were so vividly remembered, how is it that nobody who came in contact with the Muslims, with the Arabs, ever heard about him? They never, ever told the unbelievers about this person. It's here again, it strains credulity because you find Muslims all too happy to tell you about their religion. And this is not something that's newly minted. This is something that prevails throughout history. And, you know, uh, in my own church a couple of years ago, there were a couple of Muslims who started coming every Sunday and they would sit in the back and then they'd go to coffee hour and try to convert people to Islam. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really, it didn't surprise me. And throughout history, there have been Muslim preachers. There were Muslim preachers that Francis of Assisi countered when he was uh, following along with the Crusaders. The, uh, and, of course, there's the whole superstructure of the Dhimma that forces essentially Islam upon the conquered people because they, it makes life so miserable for them and promises that all they have to do to get away from all this misery and all these horrible rules and regulations that discriminate against them and perpetuate harassment against them, all they have to do is convert to Islam. A lot of them did. Mm -hmm. But in other words, Islam was always being presented. And so the idea that the uh, this massive number of people would be conquered and never presented with Islam and even the Muslim rulers would be using their their images no way right okay so when we move forward in time from from the early 600s we we don't have any good sources or any sources for a Muhammad when we when we arrive late in the the seventh century 690 691 all of a sudden we start hearing mentions of Muhammad what's wrong with all that evidence well I'll tell you the the biggest one let's go straight to the top shall we the uh, Dome of the rock the Dome of the rock is the one of the two mosques on the Temple Mount, built uh, when built in the 690s, in order to show the superiority of the conquering people over the Jews who had their temple there. Just like Hagia Sophia in Constantinople was the grandest church in the Christian world for a thousand years until it was conquered in 1453 and made into a mosque to show the superiority and victory of Islam over Christianity. And so it's the same kind of thing. But the Dome of the Rock has these inscriptions on the wall. And one of them goes like this. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but Allah. He is one. He has no associate. To him belongs sovereignty and unto him belong praise. He quickens and he gives death, and he is able to do all things. Muhammad is the servant of Allah and his messenger. Lo, Allah and his angels shower blessings on the prophet. O you who believe, ask blessings on him and salute him with a worthy salutation. The blessing of Allah be on him and peace be on him. And may Allah have mercy. O people of the book, do not exaggerate in your religion nor utter anything concerning Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three, cease, it is better for you. Allah is only one Allah. It is far removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. His is all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth, and Allah is sufficient as defender. The Messiah will never scorn to be a servant to God, nor will the favored angels. 
Whoever scorns his service and is proud, all such people he will assemble unto him. Anyway, it goes on and on. But I read that long passage for a particular reason. Muhammad is the servant of Allah and his messenger. That's the earliest mention that we have, or one of the earliest mentions that we have of a servant of Allah named Muhammad, who's the messenger of Allah as well. And so now we're really zeroing in on Islam as such. Not only that, but a lot of these things that I read, like to him belongs sovereignty and to him belongs praise. He quickens and he gives death. He's able to do all things. These are passages from the Quran, not just one single passage, though. It's chapter 64, verse 1, and then 57, 2, and then 33, 56, and so on and so on. It's jumping all around. And then it goes to talk about Jesus. So there are several things that we can conclude from this. One is that we're starting to get material that becomes the Quran, and we're starting to get Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. However, this passage is mostly about Jesus, not being the son of God, and not being one of the Trinity, but being just a prophet. Muhammad means, it's a gerundive participle in Arabic, meaning the one who is being praised, or the praised one. If you are the praised one, that's a title, that's not a name. Mm -hmm. And it is entirely possible, not certain, but I just suggest to you, you have Muhammad is the servant of Allah and his messenger. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah. That's not right together. There's a couple things in between, but still. This is coming after we don't have any mention of Muhammad, remember? And we have coins that say Muhammad with a cross, which, as we have discussed, just doesn't fit Islam. Is it possible, then, that this whole thing is about Jesus and is denying the Nicene faith that says Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior, the second person of the Trinity, and so on, denying all that and saying that he's just a servant of Allah and his messenger? And that when it says Muhammad is the servant of Allah, it means the praised one, that is, Jesus. This is supported by the fact that he uses the same uh, language for Muhammad and for Jesus, and also supported by the fact that most of the passage is about Jesus. So if you don't believe that, that, that it's referring to Jesus when it says Muhammad, the praised one, then you have to believe that the inscription says Muhammad, speaks about Muhammad, and then immediately switches, changes the subject, and starts talking about Jesus, and goes on and on and on about Jesus without saying anything else about Muhammad. It's actually much more likely that the whole thing is about Jesus, and that the word Muhammad is not a name, but a title, a reference to Jesus. Also, it's worth noting that it jumps all around, and you get four, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, four, 171, and then 1933, and then 318, and it's all different parts of the Quran. Now, if I had a Quran and I'm reading it, I might think, hey, here's a real good, just, a real good passage we could put up on the wall. Mm -hmm. But is it likely? I guess, I mean, it may be, but I think it's much more, it's, it's difficult to believe, much more difficult to believe that they said, oh, here's a good piece over here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, let's use this. And then I'll flip over 100 pages. And we'll use this. And then I'll go back 50 and we'll use this. You see? But that's the way the Dome of the Rock inscription works. So I suspect, and I'm not the first to, dis to suspect, that the passages from the Dome of the Rock inscription were put into the Quran mm -hmm. later on when the Quran was made. And not that the Quran predated them. Because there's also a lot of anomalies about the Quran, for example. I mentioned before the Quran is 653, uh, that is, in the year 653, the Quran is supposed to have been collected together by the Caliph Uthman, and he got together everybody who had memorized part of it, and everybody who'd written down part of it, and they all got together and they talked it all out, and they put together one coherent, well, no, not coherent, but one book. and they 
burned all the variants, made copies of the agreed upon book and distributed the copies to all the Muslim provinces. That's the story. And yet that's 653. 663, 673, 683, and there's still no mention of the Quran anywhere. And all these places where you might expect passages of the Quran, like the coins, or like inscriptions on buildings, or on tombstones, and there's nothing. And then only in the 690s, the 700s, and thereafter, do we start to get Quran quotes. So I think the Dome of the Rock is talking about Jesus in the first place, and in the second place, the passages from it were taken and put into the Quran here and there rather than taken from it. The Quran comes later. All right, this is great. We're kind of moving through time here. We talked about the myth of Jahiliya before, you know, uh, Muhammad, the time of Muhammad, and there's no Arab sources there. We move to 691 where things start to appear. Okay, so now let, let's go forward to when the Hadith and the Sira literature show up. What time is that and what's wrong with those sources? Well, in the first place, it starts in the middle of the 700s, or really earlier than that, 730s, 740s. But even that, we don't know for sure. In mm -hmm. Islamic tradition, it starts in the 730s, 740s, that Ibn Ishaq, a pious Muslim, began to compile his biography of Muhammad. And according to Islamic tradition, there were other biographers too, before Ibn Ishaq, but their works are lost. Now, the catch is that Ibn Ishaq's work is lost as well. We don't have any copies of Ibn Ishaq from the 730s, 740s, 750s. The earliest copies we have of Ibn Ishaq are from the 830s, because another Muslim, Ibn Hisham, took Ibn Ishaq's book and copied it out into his own biography of Muhammad, which is a massive thing, a very big thing. And he himself acknowledges that a great big chunk of it he took from Ibn Ishaq. So it's really 833 when Ibn Hisham's book is published that we get the first biography of Muhammad. That's pretty exactly 200 years, 201 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died. Were the, was there earlier literature that Ibn Hisham is working from? Was there really a book by Ibn Ishaq? Probably, but we don't know. We don't have it. And also, above all, we don't know what it said and how much Ibn Hisham might have changed it. And if you don't believe Ibn Hisham might have changed it, I don't know if I can find it real quick. I won't even bother. But I have a comparison of a passage from an earlier biography of Muhammad and then a later one. And about the same thing. And the later one, has a tremendous proliferation of detail and extra information that the earlier one doesn't have. Does the later one have access to other sources? Maybe, or maybe they're just making it all up. <clears throat> there are abundant reasons for thinking that it was all made up and that uh, we've already discussed a number of them, that there's no indication that this material existed before it starts getting written down. And also in the, middle, in, the, in the middle of the ninth century, the 830s, 840s, 850s, we start to get the Hadith collections. The Hadith, every time you do that, I think you're raising your hand to say something. <laughs> Jody. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. Maybe it's just a word of praise. But anyway, that's another story. The uh, Hadith collections, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, an they come from the 830s, 840s, 850s. And so it's the same time as the Sira literature. And the, we have voluminous detail now. We know what Muhammad was doing practically every day of his life. And we know what was, <coughs> excuse me, what was going on all the time. And yet all this material suddenly springs out of nowhere in the ninth century when there gets to be great interest in what Muhammad said and did. But it, there's no indication of this stuff before that. And there's something else too, hang on. In chapter nine of the Quran, this is in the critical Quran, which is available now. 
Actually, it's not available. It's available now for pre-order. In chapter 9, verse 41. Nope, that's not the one. Man, don't you hate it when you start getting old? In your memory <laughs> yeah. Good? Um, where is it? Do you happen to know about the, uh, the 12 months passages? No. There's months in the year. They're in chapter 9. And um, now that I've mentioned it, I just have to follow through, gentlemen, and find it. Pardon me for the delay. Here it is. Thank you. Chapter 9, verse 36, not 41, 36. Indeed, this is the critical Quran, by the way. Indeed, the number of the months with Allah is 12 months by Allah's decree on the day that he created the heavens and the earth. Four of them are sacred. That is the right religion. So do not wrong yourselves in them and wage war on all of the idolaters as they are waging war on all of you. This is chapter 9, verse 36 of the Quran. Now, look, 12 months by Allah's decree. Why is it necessary to say that? In the days before Islam, the Arab calendar was a lunar calendar, just like the Islamic calendar is now. A lunar calendar is five to ten days shorter every year than the solar calendar. And that's why the Islamic holidays move through the year. Like Ramadan starts tomorrow, and this is, Mar this is April 1st. So Ramadan starts April 2nd, 2022. And next year, it'll start in March sometime. And in a few years, it'll start in January. And a few years after that, it'll be in the summer. And you get the idea, because every year, the lunar year is shorter than the solar year. So <clears throat> the pre-Islamic Arabs made up for that by having a leap month, we have a leap day. We call it a leap year, but it's a leap day. Mm -hmm. Once every four years, there are 366 days in the year to make the solar calendar actually align with the way that the stars and planets and such are moving. The Arabs actually had a whole extra month in their calendar every few years. And that kept it in sync, roughly in sync, with the solar calendar. In the Quran, which we start getting in detail in the 700s, we hear, nope, there's 12 months in the year, that's the right religion. That's it. So in other words, no leap months. Now, you read Ibn Hisham, you read the Hadith, many times it says what month and what day Muhammad is doing this or that. But he never does a single thing during a leap month. Now that's extraordinary because if you take the standard story at face value, then Muhammad, his whole life, lived with leap months every few years. And he only abolished them, <coughs> excuse me, he only abolished them toward the end of his life. That was from Surah 9, remember, chapter 9, verse 36. Surah 9 is one of the last surahs of the Quran to be revealed. So he was born in 570, and around 630, 631, he gets Surah 9 that says no more leap months. And so he abolishes them. He obviously must have done something during the leap months all through his life. The Hadith and the Surah literature never have him doing anything during the leap months. Because, why? 200 years later, when they were writing this stuff, they forgot there ever were leap months. <laughs> so they never put anything that did Muhammad said or did in the leap months. So that's a very strong indication that all this is legendary material and not historical. <clears throat> so, so they used to use intercalation to make things line up. Now, they, because of this invented, probably invented Hadith, they're stuck with their... And holidays rotating oh. through the year. <laughs> what a mess. I, I, yeah, I, 12 months in the year, that's it. Yeah. No leap month. I had a quick question. I know they said that Muhammad was born, I think, in Mecca. Mm -hmm. But if that was true, why are they destroying all this evidence to prove their religion true and building all these great, mighty buildings around where Muhammad was supposedly born? Wouldn't, wouldn't you just love to get the archaeological evidence and, and then we could prove, then the Muslims could say, see, we 
can prove Islam is true because Muhammad existed. Why are they uh -huh. destroying all this evidence um, if, if Islam is true and Muhammad was true? Well, they're destroying it because it's a temptation to idolatry, and so they don't value it. They do not have uh, the veneration of the tombs in Sunni Islam, and particularly in Wahhabi Islam. Uh, and so the Shiite Muslims, they have prayers at tombs, and there are hadiths, Sunni hadiths, that say, this is idolatry, this is terrible, and nobody should do this. And so the Saudis, being very hardline, they destroy the archaeological evidence around Mecca because <clears throat> it isn't of any value. And it's something that they believe is actually a temptation to idolatry. But also, it doesn't matter if they, if they, even if they had preserved it all with the utmost care, there wouldn't be any record of Muhammad there. Because Mecca itself is another one, another big problem in the story. Mecca, if you read the Hadith and the Sirah, Mecca is supposed to be this thriving center of trade and pilgrimage. And there are people coming from all over the place to go to Mecca and to venerate at the Kaaba, where the Kaaba, which is still there in Mecca, and it had 360 gods in it, all the gods of the Arabs. And so the Arabs would come from all over Arabia to venerate their gods in, at the Kaaba. And supposedly Mecca was a thriving center for trade, and the tradesmen would come down from Syria, and they would trade with the Meccans. All right several problems with this one is that we actually have records of the tradesmen the people the itinerant merchants who would actually travel the spice road from europe to india and they would go straight across they would go down from constantinople into syria and from syria into iraq and iran that's it they didn't go down into mecca if you look at a map, it's a pretty much a straight line southeast from Constantinople down into India, across Syria, Iraq, Iran. But if you go down to Mecca, it's this big detour across miles of trackless desert waste. <laughs> How likely that the tradesmen did that? And actually, they didn't. They kept their itineraries because obviously a merchant wants to know where he sold something so he can go back and maybe sell more. And they never say they went to Mecca. Mecca was not a thriving center of trade. It's not even on maps from the period. And the pilgrimage business is just as suspicious because Muhammad is supposed to have united these warring Arab tribes. So the warring Arab tribes were all able to get together and rub elbows, uh, venerating their gods together at the, at the Kaaba. It doesn't seem to make sense, and like so much in the Islamic tradition. So, yeah, you know, it's it's maybe it's a shame from an archaeological standpoint, even to have ninth century material, tenth century material destroyed by the Saudis in Mecca. But that's as far back as you're going to get. You're not going to get any Muhammad before that. All right, I have a question from Jeremy in the YouTube chat. He says, regarding the Hadith, which we were just talking about, why would they make up embarrassing things about Muhammad, satanic verses, the marriage to Aisha, and so forth? This is the biggest problem with this whole theory. And I'll be the first to tell you that. My good friend David Wood bases his whole objection to this theory on that. And he's got a strong case. We debated years ago, I think it might still be on YouTube, about this, and uh, it was very tight. It was very close. Not my best debate. And, of course, I was up against a very formidable opponent. But this is the, the, the answer to that, however. This is why, nonetheless, I still don't believe that Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, is a historical figure. The, what's embarrassing to us was not necessarily embarrassing to them. And so... You take, for example, Aisha the Child Bride. Aisha the Child Bride is something that we find 
disgusting and abominable. And even Islamic apologists in the, in the West feel the same way. And that's why they go to such lengths to say, oh no, see, Aisha was really 18 or Aisha was 30 or whatever. Uh, it's a lot of nonsense, but they are showing that they're embarrassed by this too. Now, there is no trace of this in the Islamic texts. There's plenty of trace in the Islamic texts about Zainab. You know Zainab? Zainab is his daughter-in-law who he married, Muhammad. She was very pretty, and uh, his son-in-law said, why don't you take her? And it's sort of a sordid story, but there's a lot of embarrassment about that. And this preposterous tale concocted of which there are traces in the Quran, chapter 24, verse 4, and chapter 24, verse 13, that the whole thing was made up in order to give Muslims the knowledge that adoption was wrong because Muhammad's son was adopted, Zayd bin Muhammad, who then went back to using his birth name, his father's name, Zayd bin Haritha, because adoption is illegitimate. And that suddenly made Zayd not his son, so Zainab wasn't his daughter-in-law. And so it wasn't a problem that he married her. And, and anyway, <clears throat> that mm. that the people who concocted that story were embarrassed by it. And so they had to come up with some explanation. Although there's another theory that I talk about in Did Muhammad Exists, that that story was also invented for a theological purpose, but that's, that's another story for another time. The point here is that clearly people have been embarrassed by that one but nobody shows any embarrassment about Aisha and child marriage was something that was relatively common so Aisha might seem scandalous to us wasn't scandalous to them but there's plenty you can use and David Wood has lots of them why would they make up <clears throat> something like Muhammad thinking he's possessed by demons well, the answer to that is to show that he has power over the demons because they don't win. They, he thinks that he's under a spell. He thinks that he's demon-possessed, but it all works out in the end because he's the powerful prophet. And so it's actually, in kind of a clumsy way, a story that is designed to show his power. And we could go through every last one uh, and... and, and, and see that and some we might not be able to see we in other words there are some stories we might not understand why it would have been invented however i think it's likely that for all the stories there is a reason why it was invented that has some apologetic purpose in islam actually i will tell the rest of the zainab story in order to illustrate what i'm saying now uh the end of the Zainab story in, in the Quran, it's in chapter 33, but it's not told. It's just alluded to. And after, it, it, I'll actually say what it actually says, rather than just paraphrase it, because I don't want to get it wrong. In, I'm not going to tell you what edition of the Quran I'm using. we will have to give it. Uh, chapter <laughs> Same way. Um, sorry. It is, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. When you said to him, on whom Allah has conferred favor and you conferred favor, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. In the story, Muhammad said that to Zayd. And you hid in your mind what Allah was going to bring to light, and you feared mankind, whereas Allah has a better right that you should fear him. So when Zayd had performed the necessary formality from her, we gave her to you in marriage so that there may be no sin for believers in regard to the wives of their adopted sons. So the, Allah was so concerned that believers would not think they couldn't marry the ex-wives of their adopted sons that he went through all this rigmarole. Uh, but anyway, it goes on. There is no reproach for the prophet. This is verse 38, 30, chapter 33, verse 38. There's no reproach for the prophet in what Allah has prescribed for him. That was Allah's way with those who passed away of old. And the commandment of Allah is certain destiny. Who delivered the messages of Allah and feared him and feared no one except Allah. Allah keeps good account. And here's the end of the story, chapter 33, verse 40. Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. 
and Allah is always aware of all things. Now, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men is a statement referring to his not being the father of Zayd, because Zayd's adopted and there's no more adoption. But why does it say then he's not the father of any of your men, but he's the seal of the prophets? Because in Islam, all the prophets are related. And if you are the son of a prophet, then you're a prophet. If you are the grandson of a prophet, you're a prophet. Shiite Islam preserves this, actually. The idea of the imam, the imamate, is that uh, Ali is the son-in-law of Muhammad. And then every imam after that, the ruler of the Shiite community, has to be a member of Ali's household, Muhammad's household, because the prophetic gift is transmitted through the family tie. And so if that's true, then everybody who is related to Muhammad is a prophet. So Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he's the seal of the prophets. Muhammad's the last prophet. There are no more prophets after him. That can only be true if he doesn't have a son. Because if he has a son, his son will be a prophet. So some people say that the whole story of Zayd and Zainab was invented in order to, em to emphasize that Muhammad doesn't have any sons. Not natural, not adopted. He's the last prophet. Right. So if that's the case with that story, which it may be, it could also be true that every one of these stories is invented for a theological purpose within Islam even Aisha. It may be that the Aisha story was invented because you had guys who wanted to marry little kids. And so they justified it by saying their prophet did it. Or it may be that this, Ali is the hero of the Shiites. Aisha is the hero of the Sunnis. In the 650s, they fought the battle of the camel. When Ali, he was passed over when Umar and Uthman became the caliph. And then he finally became the caliph, the successor of Muhammad. But Al Aisha wouldn't accept it. And she ultimately raised up Muawiyah to overthrow Ali. And before that, she fought Ali. She was in the, uh, in the howdah, in the little box on the back of the camel, directing the troops to fight Ali because she would not accept him as the caliph. Now, Ali based his claim to be the rightful successor of Muhammad on the fact that he was, outside of Khadija, Muhammad's earliest successor, and that he was very young, Muhammad's earliest follower, excuse me, and he was very young when he became Muhammad's earliest follower. He was like 12. <clears throat> so the Sunnis invented a story of Aisha being even younger than Ali. He was 12. Oh, yeah, well, she was six. <laughs> and so she, out, she, she outdoes Ali. Nice, and nice. so even the child marriage might be actually a parable for a theological purpose to fight between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Right. I remember your debate with David Wood. I've seen it. And if I can find it, I'll put it in the description box so others can watch it. But I, it would seem to me, you know, I'm, I haven't studied his, history, how, how they do it. But the principle of embarrassment is a corroboration is good for corroborating something you already believe might be history. But by itself, it can't prop up uh, a truth of history. For example, you know, if we read the Iliad, there's all kinds of embarrassing things that the, that the Greeks do, you know, Achilles goes and mopes in his tent. Uh, the gods are mercurial and vindictive and vain. It's, it's very embarrassing from our perspective, but that doesn't make it real history. So I, I don't think that, you know, that works as an argument, just generally. Okay, last thing, as we went through this timeline, we looked at all the sources. Why, if this is all invented, why would they invent a Muhammad? Why invent Islam? Why invent a Quran? Back in those days, you had two great powers, the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire and the uh, Persian Empire. The Byzantines were Christians. The Persians were Zoroastrians. 
And that was not just the dominant religion, that was the glue of each empire. The Eastern Roman Empire was held together by Christianity. In other words, you had no other thing that united all these disparate peoples of disparate races and ethnicities and backgrounds, except that they were Christians. It was the official religion of the empire, but even that is an understatement. In those days, there were no constitutions. There were no parliaments. So, you know, you can say the United States is the polity that is ruled by the U.S. Constitution. The Byzantine Empire, what's that? It's the Christian Empire. That was what held it together. That was what gave it an identity. And that's why the uh, empire was so interested in formulating the Christianity with absolute precision so that it could define what was a citizen and what wasn't. And so all the er early ecumenical councils, all the ecumenical councils, the earliest hammering out of the faith, they were called by the emperors because the emperor was very involved in wanting to have the empire unified. And so he wanted to come to the people and say, this is the faith. We all hold it. This is our empire. The Persians did the same thing with Zoroastrianism. <clears throat> the Arabs, because the Persians and the Byzantines had exhausted themselves fighting a series of wars against each other, and their forces were depleted, the Arabs were able to take advantage of that and amass this huge empire. And then what do they need to tie their empire together? They needed a religion, just like the other empires had. So they made one up. And they made up one that was martial and imperialistic, aggressive, violent, and expansionist, because these were people who were making up the religion in order to preserve the empire, so they inculcated all that as virtue, so their empire would grow and prosper. Yeah, it explains so much. It has explanatory power. And, and you know, I love to look for historic parallels, like you mentioned Robin Hood, and in your book, other legends that have grown up around perhaps initially historical people, but have become myth or legend. And one that uh, attracts my eye is similar to the situation with Islam is the Aeneid uh, written by Virgil for the Roman Empire, because the Romans saw that the Greeks had their Iliad and the Iliad as a history, as a national epic and united the Greeks who were disparate, you know, warning, warring nation states. And they wanted something like that for Rome. So they had Virgil write the Aeneid, the story of Aeneas, who comes from, you know, Troy and, and establishes Rome. And he does a lot of the things that, you know, Achilles and, and, and um, Odysseus do. And so for them, it becomes their unifying national epic. epic. And the, it, it seems to me that the Muslims are doing something similar or, or the initial uh, creation of Islam was, was similar. Now, we know who wrote the Aeneid. We know it was Virgil. They, we have lots of history from the Romans, but we don't know the, the genesis of, of Islam completely. But when we find a parallel like that, I think that's helpful in illustrating why they might have it, done it just as you explained. Yeah, that's a great point. I love that. I think I might steal that. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, I've wondered why nobody else pointed out that parallel because I just, you know, I, I guess I've studied the Greeks and the Romans more <laughs> than the history of the Christians, the Byzantines, and the Persians. So that that immediately leaped out to me. So right in the in the next revision of the book, you be sure and put that in there. <laughs> Maybe worth a, a, an article. I'll have to look into that. Oh, okay, great. So. Yeah, that like pretty much covers a lot of what's in the book. Of course, there's more detail. There's footnotes. There's references. And I, you know, I read it recently. I did a report for school. So, and I have my copy here open with all my highlights. In it, it's a Kindle copy. They're they're electric electronic highlights. But uh, uh, let's see. I have a question from the chat. Talitha Kumi says, "Have enjoyed your books, Robert Spencer. How many times has the Quran been changed?" I wish I knew. Uh, that's one thing that actually in the critical Quran is uh, like you find in Bibles, uh, different readings from different manuscripts, and they're noted in footnotes. This is 
one of the first Qurans, I actually thought it was the first Quran to do this, but then people started telling me on Twitter, oh no, there's what about this one? And what about that one? But it's really quite uncommon that uh, I've got variant readings listed. Um, and so for example, let's see, very simple things like in uh, Alankabut, no, not Alankabut, sorry. In An Nahal, the B, chapter twenty-four, uh, chapter sixteen, verse twenty-four, um, and when it is said to them, "What has your Lord revealed?" they say, "Fables of the men of old." And so there is another manuscript of the Quran that doesn't say when it is said to them; it says where it is said to them. A small difference, but you have to remember also that Islamic apologists for years have been saying that every last copy of the Quran is exactly like every other copy. And this is part of the miraculous preservation of the Quran by Allah. And so uh, that's just not true. And I show that to be the case here. Um, chapter, uh, what is Joseph? Chapter Joseph 12, 109. We did not send before you any, before you accept, any before you accept men to whom we revealed from among the people of the towns. And uh, the Warsh Quran, which is a manuscript tradition in Africa, says to whom he revealed, not to whom we revealed, and things like that. Uh, I also have two apocryphal Shiite chapters, two apocryphal Shiite surahs at the end of the book uh, that circulated in the 17th century, seem to date from a little bit before that. And the, the Shiites actually don't even accept them as part of the Quran. But the fact that they were written at all and circulated indicates that the Quran, at least by some people, was considered to be far more fluid than we assume it to be today. What about the, uh, I was, I, I remember David Wood was talking about the part of the Quran that the lamb or the sheep ate. Is <laughs> yeah. that... Uh, is that in your Quran? I think it's in the Hadith, but it's not actually in the Quran. Is that in your Quran? Well, a sheep ate it. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, but it's on. It's in the Hadith, so you could have you could have put yes, it in there. Yeah, it is. It's in the notes. It's not in the Quran itself because the Hadith doesn't give the text. It just says that there was a text about the breastfeeding business. You know that uh, if you have an unmarried man and an unmarried woman, they cannot be alone together unless she breastfeeds him. And then they'll be chased. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making this up. Because then she's his foster mother. And there's a Hadith in which Aisha says, this was in the Quran, but a tame sheep ate this piece. And so... Uh, that's noted in the, in the footnotes in the critical Quran, along with the stoning passage that uh, the Caliph Umar says that Muhammad practiced stoning and it was part of the Quran. And now it's not. He doesn't explain why not, but he says, I sure hope people aren't going to stop stoning just because it's not in the Quran anymore. It used to be. So how much of the Quran is missing then? There's a lot of Quran missing. Um, it's, uh, well, let's see, Chap what chapter is it? I believe it's 33, but let me make sure that I'm not uh, getting this wrong. Yeah, chapter 33. Chapter 33, according to Aisha, was much longer than it is now. It is now 73 verses in the Quran that you can get today. But according to a Hadith, Aisha says, Surat al-Ahzab, which is chapter 33, used to be recited in the time of the Prophet with 200 verses. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was unable to procure more of it than what there is today. So 127 verses of that are gone. And who knows what else? Well, what, what about the uh, Quran? And I've heard some, maybe uh, Drew Dambreaker or maybe even on uh, Jay Smith's program about how the Quran might have been all about Jesus. What, uh, what, what, what's that all about? Well, there's only four mentions of Muhammad in the Quran. And 
with all of them, it's the same problem that we have with the other things, other mentions of Muhammad from the seventh century that we were talking about before. There's no indication that the person Muhammad, who is named in the Quran, is the prophet of Islam we start hearing about in the 800s. The four mentions are all very spare, and they just say the name. Like, for example, chapter 48, verse 29 says, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Those who follow him are ruthless to unbelievers, merciful to one another. There ain't nothing in there about Muhammad, just his name, and that he's the messenger of Allah. So here again, it could be that, it, that it's just a title that applies to Jesus or to somebody else. And that it may be that that's the case, that the Quran was originally a Christian text, but against Nicene Christianity against the divinity of Christ and so on, and that it was modified to create the Quran. And did Muhammad exist? I actually talk about this a lot because there is a lot of Christian material, there are traces of Christian material in the Quran and uh, <clears throat> passages that don't make any sense unless you have reference to Christianity. For example, chapter five, at the end, toward the end of chapter five, Verse 112, when the disciples said, O Jesus, son of Mary, is your Lord able to send down for us a table spread with food from heaven? He said, observe your duty to Allah if you are true believers. We wish to eat from it so that we may satisfy our hearts and know that you have spoken truth to us and that of it we may be witnesses. Jesus, son of Mary, said, O Allah, our Lord, send down for us a table spread with food from heaven so that it may be a feast for us, for the first of us and for the last of us, and a sign from you. Give us sustenance, for you are the best of sustainers. Allah said, indeed, I sent it down for you, and whoever disbelieves among you afterward, I will surely punish him with a punishment with which I have not punished anyone of the world. Now, what on earth is that all about? A table with food from heaven. Well, in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And of course, you have in the other, the synoptic gospels, uh, the last supper, where he says he took bread and broke it and says, take, eat, this is my body. And it gives sustenance. It is the bread from heaven and so on. There's a whole lot more, actually. It's uh, where it says, so that it may be a feast for us. That's chapter 5, verse 114. The word feast is Eid, which is the same for the uh, Muslim feasts, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. But this is the only time it appears in the Quran. And, of course, the Christians of the 6th century, when they would celebrate the Eucharist and partake of the body of Christ, they called it a feast. So uh, there was, oh yeah, there's even more. For the first of us and for the last of us is a phrase that's also found nowhere else in the Quran. And literally it means all, nobody excluded. This is a Christian liturgical phrase referring to the body and blood of Christ, which is offered for you and for many for the remission of sins. So you see, that is something that doesn't really make sense in the Quran. Or it's just some weird miracle that Jesus gratuitously brings down a bread, a table full of food from heaven. But it makes sense when you start looking at it in terms of Christianity. And there are many, many other passages of that kind. All right. I have a question from RJ. He asks, was the Kaaba actually made by Muhammad? And does the dating line up with when Muslims believe it was built? The Kaaba was not made by Muhammad. Muslims don't believe the Kaaba was built by <laughs> Muhammad. They believe the Kaaba was built by Abraham and Ishmael after Sarah kicked them out. And they went into Mecca to Arabia and they built the Kaaba at Mecca. There is a great deal of problem with this. And uh, this is one of the most interesting things in uh, Did Muhammad Exist? If I do say so myself, that the uh, Muslims, in, everywhere they build a mosque all around the world, the mosque 
faces Mecca, and specifically, actually, the Kaaba. If you've ever been in a mosque, you have seen a niche in the wall called a mihrab that points the way to Mecca. If there's no mihrab, there's a sign on the wall that points the way to Mecca, like in an airport mosque. But the early mosques don't face Mecca. Most of the early mosques face Petra in southern Jordan. Why? There, was a, there were actually Kaabas all over. It was not a unique structure. And it does seem as if the uh, origins of Islam are actually in southern Jordan. The language of the uh, Arabic Quran is also the Arabic of southern Jordan, not southern Arabia. And for a variety of reasons, I have to, I have to go at 6.30, but for a variety of reasons, this whole thing was transposed into Mecca, but there's uh, no contemporary historical evidence for it. All right. Well, let's let's wrap it up then, because this has been great. We covered a lot of great, uh, good territory. We we went through this timeline. We went through the the basic principles of your book. I put all the references in the description box, or I will. I haven't done that yet. And uh, just you know, I want to thank you, Robert, again for coming out to and uh, sharing with us. Your knowledge is encyclopedic as always. It's it's wonderful to to be able to ask you any question and and see all this depth behind it. I want to thank everyone in the chat for their uh, kindness and, and for their questions and their participation and for watching. Please uh, give us a like and subscribe. And Jody, I'll give you the last word. All right. Pray for us and uh, subscribe to our channel, Disciples of YHWH in Christ, and share the video. Share, 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 and share some more. And then uh, that's the only way we can get it out. And then share again and again. But we appreciate uh, Robert for being on our program. And God bless everyone for joining us today. Goodbye. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Hey, Robert, Sorry, I got a... what, what, yeah. One question. Yes, sir. Uh, um, do, do me and Scott get your get the own... <laughs> Own personal uh, Quran there, me and Scott. Uh, did we get your personal copy, autograph? Uh, well, um, I don't actually have any except this one right now. This is it. I'm supposed to get some, and so email me in a week or two, and we'll see what we can work out. Oh, I want, I want that one right there, the, your personal <laughs> copy, and I can say, yeah, that was Roberts. I'll talk to you in email. God bless you. Bye bye. Thanks. God bless. Thank you. Bye. God bless.